Welcome everyone to Pontos Fathom Press. This is episode 29 of the Pontos Fathom podcast. And our topic today is Ghosts of the Fourth Dimension, Rudolf Steiner, the Ether, and 19th century occult knowledge. So to give a little context uh, for this lecture, I'm going to start out with Steiner's book, The Occult Movement of the 19th Century. And also a lecture of his that was uh, delivered uh, over in the early 1900s, and I think even up until 1920s, he was still talking on the topic about the fourth dimension. And there's some very interesting um, topics here, especially around the idea of the ether and how science turned away from the concept of the ether and replaced it with the void. Right? So we all have learned from modern physics that they say outer space is a void. But there was, as recent as the 19th century, a theory that space was actually an ether, a kind of some kind of medium. And actually, if you think about current physics, there are some of these properties, missing properties of the ether that still rear up their heads in the problematic nature of modern cosmology, let's say. So, for example, we have dark matter, which has somewhat parts of this ether concept. And we also seem to see this in some of these um, uh, pan, pan-spiritualistic type of uh, beliefs in which consciousness may be the transmitted by the medium, right? So then if we start looking, you know, if we start looking at science's view of its empirical measure, post-enlightenment science. But then we also look to the, let's call it the flaws of science or the areas of science that have not quite been fully described by the materialist vision. We start to see some very interesting points in here. I think uh, this Steiner lecture around the uh, the fourth dimension uh, touches on a lot of these. So we'll root it in this occult movement of the 19th century and then we'll, we'll tie it into this idea of disembodied spirits. And I think that even will lead into some interesting talk around actions at a distance. Right? One of those things that differentiate magic from, from science is science will talk about a cause. Right? So we, if we find a cause, there's a, a kind of a, um, a balance of causality where every, every action through time is related to a prior state and that state creates another state. But when you have an action at a distance that doesn't seem to have any connectivity, that was in the past thought of as magic. You know, for example, uh, we don't quite know the science behind something around the possibilities of remote viewing, around the possibilities of clairvoyance, around the possibilities of the idea of a soul, right? Because some of these things are not measurable, right? The idea that we could have vision at a distance through thinking, but then suddenly it becomes possible if we dip our toes into the paranormal, we dip our toes into the pseudosciences, so, so-called pseudosciences. Um, and I think that the Steiner Lecture on the Fourth Dimension is a, a very interesting place to start. So before we jump into it, I just wanna uh, call out to, some of these topics are actually going to be uh, discussed in the forthcoming computational complexity in psychiatric agency. It's the third volume of Moldenhauer's Artificial Psychology of Desiring Machines. I think it's a very interesting take uh, on the idea of not only the possibility of a thinking machine, but the spiritual possibility of a soul within a machine. And also the kind of... um, cautionary idea of our own human machine, which is our body, in which our souls sit in, becoming more automated by uh, societal trends and practices, right? So I think it touches on a lot of uh, the ethics of AI in in a spiritual view. So it's very very different kind of uh, collection. The idea of machine desire in the first volume uh, going on to our human anticipation of artificial 
intelligence and what a psychoanalysis of that artificial intelligence looks like. Uh, and then finally, the psychiatric agency. And I think you could almost call it spiritual agency as well. So uh, check these out, the links below. Uh, they'll be, uh, volume one is already in release. Volume two and three will be coming out this year. So, so let's jump into this talk about uh, the ghost of the fourth dimension. So uh, amazingly, I found this Steiner lecture in which Steiner talks about uh, you know, let's start back to the idea of, I know we've done this topic before, but let's just think of the idea of a, a sphere. So we have a sphere, and the sphere, from a certain point of view, say from the top view, a sphere can look just like a circle, right? A sphere can, we can use this circle here on the, say this is the diameter of a sphere. You can imagine a sphere intersecting this tabletop, right? So it, it, would, it would come up to about this height, and it would go below the surface at some some same depth, by the same diameter depth, or the same radius depth. What's interesting about that circle from a planar point of view is that we can imagine the sphere as just a rotation of this circle into a higher dimension, right? So in two dimensions, we see a circle, but if we were to rotate that circle perpendicular to this axis, that would carve out the space of a sphere. But if we were two-dimensional beings, we wouldn't quite have that, as the elephants circle around here, right? If we were two-dimensional beings, we wouldn't quite have the luxury of that third-dimensional space. It would seem magical that there could be some other parts of a circle above us. Just as uh, we humans in three-dimensional space aren't quite able to think of a hypersphere. And a hypersphere would be, just as a circle is a 2D sphere, um, and a sphere, a ball, a globe, is a 3D sphere, there is actually a sphere that goes beyond the 3D sphere with another orthogonal dimension, meaning another angle, like not just X, Y, and Z coordinates. So this would be X and Y, and, and then we add a third dimension, Z. Imagine if we had another orthogonal angle, 90 degrees in four space going off of this. It's very difficult to comprehend. But one tool Steiner gives us to think about it is with the idea of a square. Uh, and, and he'll say a cube, say if we did the same exercise, but instead of a, uh, instead of a circle, we have a, a square, which maps out as a cube. If we unfold the cube, the six sides of a cube, we actually have a cross on two, 2D. And then we could assemble a three-dimensional cube by folding up the sides of a cross and then finally capping it at the top so that we would have this advantage of a third dimension. And you, you can imagine a cube in front of us. And I think it's very interesting because uh, Steiner also talks about the intuition for this kind of thinking, right? So the intuition of this thinking then says, okay, well now let us think about a fourth dimensional cube. And this is where we don't have that ability to kind of think of it uh, because it is a cube that has extra cubes folded out up into four space that we don't see in our three, three space cube. Now the one interesting thing he says is you can imagine a cube, if a cube was sitting on this table, there would be a square mapped out by the base of the cube, but then there was a second square that's at the opposite side of the cube. So if we move up, there's a second square at the top. So if you think of it as a die, there's the six and then the one, right? That floating cube that's out of the plane would actually be invisible to us. We wouldn't be able to see that, that cube. And if we were to just lift, let's say we had this, go back to our circle analogy, if we were to lift this circle out of the plane, the sphere can exist in three space but it would not leave any circle behind on two space. And that would seem like magic to us, right? It would seem that if you had something that had a property in a higher dimension that doesn't intersect with a lower dimension, it would look like it disappeared, right? So this is where Steiner gets into the talk about disembodied spirits, right? And, and I think some of this leads us back to Blavatsky, right? Because Blavatsky talks about ghosts here. She say, further on, we'll give abundant proof of ancient authors uh, neglecting this truism. 
Now, we will only again assert that no spirit claimed by spiritualists to be human has ever been proved to be such on sufficient testimony. The influences of the disembodied spirits and communicated subjectively to them by sensitivities. These can produce objective manifestations, but cannot produce themselves otherwise than they are described. They are also somewhat even called materialized. Now, you can imagine this a materialized idea. If a sphere was pointing above us, and we lowered that sphere down to touch this plane, we'd first see a, a dot, and then a small circle, then a bigger circle as we got to the size of the sphere's diameter. And then as a sphere passed through the table, it would seem to disappear. Steiner kind of gets his, uh, obviously Steiner was early a theosophist before he moved on to anthroposophy. So this idea of materialization, and again, this idea of thinking of them as devils or somehow spirits um, is something to, to like, let's hold that thought, right? And we'll just stick with the idea of a disembodied potentiality. Uh, there's one place where Steiner's talking about uh, the, the burning bush of Moses, right? So in Moses, the burning bush appears as a flame, right? But it is the I am, and he hears the voice of I am. But we can imagine almost in this fourth dimensional sense that in the fourth dimension is where the deity maybe has more shape and only gives enough intersection with our world that it appears as some kind of event, some kind of un unknowable energy, a fire, maybe even a burning bush. So it, it wasn't a bush on fire, Steiner goes on to say. It was That was how Moses saw through what anyone else would have confused as a fire. He saw through to see maybe that fourth dimensional aspect, something like this, right? So we say here, we'll go back to Blavatsky a bit more. She says, uh, they see the spirit moving on the air and the image of a human spirit moving by the ladder like a marionette and unable to act or utter words imposed upon them by the immortal soul. One of the most powerful attractions of our departed ones is their strong affection for those whom they have left on the earth. It draws irresistibly by degree into the current of the astral light vibrating between the person sympathetic to them and the universal soul. Right. So this idea of the materialization, and she goes on to talk a bit more about the idea of feeling a warm hand or seeing some um, kind of materialized spirit in the night and how this might just be a, a, a process of this uh, spirit. And we can go back to this Blavatsky, but maybe we'll focus for now on just uh, some point of, of Steiner's here, where he even goes so far to talk about this in terms of the ether. And um, one of the, the topics that was, that's very interesting is when he talks about how the conception of a child happens, right? So he'd say, well, biologically, we'd think of the conception. So this is sort of the voyage of the soul into the material body. And he would talk about the conception of the soul as, so, so ghosts, we often think of a ghost as after life, right? But before life, there's also a spirit, a Holy Spirit, right? An Annunciation, right? The Annunciation of Mary begins with the angel visiting her, right? The angel, the spirit visits her, right? And then she's with, with child. Uh, but actually Steiner says, although the biological moment of conception is linked to the to the biological fertilization between man and woman. The, he says the events take place long before that moment. So, you know, here's, here's to go back to one's birth date, one's conception date, and then the date even before that, that might have aligned the out of visible space occurrences perhaps happening at this higher dimension, in which the two loving people are coming together, in which a spirit coming down into the into um, human form is, is, occurs. And he expresses that this is happening on the ether, right? So the ether is a medium in which the souls are participating. And he goes, uh, He goes through this to say uh, about 
um, the forces of reproduction are transformed in the spiritual world into forces of help of the soul are trying to come down as soon as they may be into the physical world. These are considered with us to show how the spiritual and yonder side of the threshold works on the physical world in individual concrete realities. Moreover, we do not learn, learn to know the physical world truly until we realize the forces are unleashed as a result of the fact that the human being discards certain teeth and develops others. Puberty is again brought about by the unfolding forces. When the human being is actually reaching puberty, puberty the forces have quite a different function. Uh, all these leads to the question, why is man prevented in his ordinary life from looking into the spiritual world? The spiritual world is barred on both sides. We see our outer nature as a veil covering the lies beyond it. If a man can perceive the veil, he's, a, he's in the spiritual world. Right, so this awareness, we're not aware of that world. We're not able to see it. And although science, uh, although science um, is giving us some great materials, tools to look at the power. Look, we can look at a number of powerful things uh, with materialism, this set of eyes. We still are not able to see these things at a distance, we'll say. Right. So then let's kind of go into, let's go into that a bit. So some of this uh, is known to the uh, cult movement of the 19th century, right? So we, he talks about the, the further the individual advances in his development, the more clearly differentiated in structure will his soul organism be. In a person with an undeveloped life of soul, this organism is confused, relatively formless. But even in a confused soul organism, the clairvoyant can perceive a form that stands out distinctly from its environment. It appears to be an independent body possessing certain organs. These organs now are considered are perceptually, spiritually near the parts of the physical body. And we're going to call these the chakras. These organs are called by occultists the chakras or the wheels. And he says, then there's this imagery, sort of, there's an imagery, and I think this imagery comes out even with people who are, uh, you know, using ayahuasca or, or something like this, where they start to see spirit forms. They start to see spirit forms, animal forms, eyes, humanoid, but ent ent energy entities. These kind of entity forms in the past probably were considered devils or demons, right? In the currently we're calling them entities. Maybe they're aliens, right? There's a number of terms for these, these forms. And what makes it confusing for us comes down to something that Steiner says about the fourth dimension again. The idea here is imagine, okay, we can imagine the spirit between pre-birth and post-life, right? And I think there's a drawing here of uh, Steiner has of the idea of the soul leaving and beginning a new life, right? So here you have this idea of birth and then there's death and the soul kind of goes through and then there's a new life coming. So this sort of repeating of life, right? This incarnations and the soul is having a, a, a human essence to it. And yet it's, um, if you look at the life in the third dimension, we see these events. I think a great example of it is having having kids. And I think even you pet owners out there can see it. You start out with a puppy, and then, you know, old yeller has his passing, right? Uh, or your kids grow up before your eyes, right? And, and you stay relatively the same. You get a little older, but you've already matured. You've already reached maturity, but you can see time through the children. And you can dial back into it, kind of like Dr. Strange does with his time time stone there, his time eye. You can dial back to, with your memories to the past and you can dial forward to the future. But from a fourth dimensional, and we'll almost call it the spiritual, the initiate level, I think Steiner would call it, um, that kind of timeline is almost turned upside down. So the idea is it's not so much uh, in sequential order, it's more like a continuum that, oh yeah, you know, uh, it's, it's almost like that aphorism that you could if you always see people as they were a baby and as they will be on their dying bed, you will have a great empathy toward the human struggle. And this is a great powerful way of talking about it, right? The powerful way of talking about it is atemporally, we are all in the third dimension, somewhat projected down from the fourth dimension by time into a lifespan in which we are encountering and experiencing and engaging, right? And I think that what's very clear is 
uh, there are certain things about being in the third dimension, being in bodies, where if we take on some of these, um, I want to say, appreciative forms of thinking, but also tend to move away from seeing it as a tragedy or seeing it as demonic or seeing it as possession or seeing it as even as religious and seeing it more as a phenomenon that we all experience. I think it goes a long way to um, helping the human experience to give us a purpose here and also to ground us in some of these, I'm almost going to say Jungian archetypal forms and stories that we find ourselves in. Uh, there is, for example, in the idea of um, in the idea of our our mission, right? It is it, it could it can be quite sad to focus on the death event, to focus on the fall from spirit into into flesh, right? There's been many Gnostic groups that had vows of celibacy, right? Because it's trapping the light in the body. Right? And this might be an this might be a, an extreme reaction to it, but maybe it's kind of a, a mystery school that had to develop to just explore that area. And I think this is why religions that have anthropomorphic deities and see the entities as uh, personalities. You know, you, you hear in, in Krishna consciousness, you hear Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead, and participating in the pastimes, right? This participation of the pastimes, that God could be a friend, that God, and this is throughout religions. God can be wise, God can be a friend, God can be angry father, right? There can be a number of different archetypal forms of the spirit. You know, if we go back to this, uh, Steiner takes us back in his, uh, in his talks of the 19th century occult movements and some of those uh, mystery schools that were taking on that Atlantean kind of concepts. Uh, Steiner goes back to talk about in, in post-Atlantean times, the life of man between birth and death has had its influence also on the body-free condition after death. The more man turned his interest to the physical world, the greater was the possibility for Ahriman to find his way to the soul after earthly life. So this is sort of like an alignment, and it's about momentum. You know, um, uh, I think lots of... Uh, people talking about momentum these days where, uh, you know, if you have a certain momentum going, you know, depression is kind of a momentum, right? If you can break that momentum with, say, healthy activity, healthy natural activity, um, uh, finding something that can lift one up from it. Now you can remove yourself from that plane that you might be trapped in, a lower dimension of yourself. And as you ascend that ladder, and this is a dimensional ladder, right? And that, and that fourth dimensional view is probably just one dimension and we won't get into fifth and sixth and seventh dimensions but there's a there's a lot of that we've talked about it in some of the other videos right man is gradually approaching more nearly to what can be in a spiritual world how this degree of attainment can be marred with other influence but nonetheless be clearly envisaged are what we are studying mankind's evolutionary course among the egyptian people hermes saw this that the individuals should prepare themselves during life for communion with the spirit of light, right? And this is kind of uh, leads us to the idea of our inspirations and our intuitions. You know, so one one mystery. I think I'll, maybe I'll leave it on this mystery. You know, there is a Rosicrucian concept here. And again, we talked about unfolding the sphere. I'm un, uh, sorry, unfolding the cube, and it becomes a cross. And that symbol is the cross of the Rosa cross, in, in a way, I, I'd like to say. In order to make clear what one has now to happen, let us return once more to the symbol of the Rose cross. When we meditate upon the Rose cross, we have before us a picture, the component parts which are derived from the sense world, the black color of the cross, the roses, and so forth. But the assembling of the parts to form the Rose cross is, is a deed the origin of which is no longer in the sense world. If now the pupil of spirit were to try to let the black cross and the red roses 
disappear completely from his consciousness, retaining nothing but the spiritual activity. In this activity, he has the substance of a kind of meditation that can lead him in course of time to inspiration. He should look to his own soul and ask him, what was I doing when I brought crosses and roses together to form a symbolic picture? So this intuition and this inspiration that comes out of our meditations, it's just a small nugget here. And I think it really links to Steiner's talk on the Golgotha mystery, right? Because here's Christ at the garden knowing his future, right? Just like a fourth dimensional state, right? The st the, this fourth dimensional, the sadness, and then the collapsing of the fourth dimension into the moment and saying, you know, uh, let it be done, kind of, let it be done, right? And so I think that this is a real powerful, uh, and it's a Christian image, but I don't think it, it's only a Christian image. It's just the idea of letting our spirit um, lend itself toward being known through meditation on this higher, higher dimensionality. And I think the last note here is just talking about this idea that things are possible when they don't seem that they are possible. And this is a quite interesting place to meditate on. So the idea here is, um, let's just think of it in the simplest way. Like, oh, um, when, we're, when we're, I can remember being a teenager and you want to be older, right? And then you get older and you want to be younger, right? So some of those worries take you out of the now, right? If you enjoy your youth and then you enjoy your adulthood and then you enjoy your old age, uh, and when we say enjoy it, we really mean when you are living in your time. I mean, this is a great way to do it. And I think aligning oneself to the wisdom of those higher levels uh, is, a, is a way to help meditate on that. And also it's a way to have hope, right? Because the idea here is things can come that might not be visible in this world, right? Uh, and then I think it becomes a ladder again as we move up from those despair levels to the hope levels and the inspiration levels, as we climb up that, that ladder of the future is also a ladder into possibilities of changing the future, right? And this is where we get into fifth and sixth dimensional thinking, right? So the idea of there's a world in which we've all come together and climbed the ladder together, uh, I think this is a, a great place to to, to rest because I think this is a you know maybe a topic for the next lect lecture. So anyway, I hope you guys liked it. Um, check out the occult movement of Rudolf Steiner in the 19th century. It is a fascinating book. Uh, he does talk a lot about the eighth sphere. He talks about Arimonic influences, but I think you can get a bit of the sense of how um, Steiner is both on both sides of this equation. He says right here, it was in the order that the impulses of the mystery of Gol Golgotha might wax in strength and take root in the souls of men, in the feelings of the believers, so that men may inwardly deepen. In ancient times, clairvoyance was, after all, an external faculty. It was not just a question of having to acquire it by effort. It was a heritage. Just as today, man, and when he says man, he means people. This is the way people used to talk, right? Uh, people have eyes and ears, so in the times they had the faculty of clairvoyance. But at times are approaching when clairvoyance will be increasingly gained, it made it necessary that the one phase of the existence be shut off from the spiritual world and be confined in the outer material world, the mineral world, and that everything might be built up again from within. And he sketches it this way. Science sort of shows us that our eyes are are taking in photons, but actually we are reaching out to the world. And I think on that reaching out, this is where that fourth dimensional um, topic becomes so, so important. So I, thank you guys for listening. Uh, hope you enjoyed this week's uh, podcast. Uh, check out our other videos below. As you know, if you can like and subscribe, uh, really appreciate it. We're trying to grow this channel. You can also check out our bookstore below and uh, what purchases help to uh, bring you this content. So by all means, do leave a chat, a uh, comment in the, uh, in the comment, leave a comment below. And 
looking forward to doing a live stream at some point. My goal is to get the channel up to a thousand subscribers. So if you like what we're doing, ring the bell and let's turn this into a talking community. In the meantime, leave some comments. I read all the comments and looking forward to talking to everyone. Thanks a lot and bye bye.